we are now in a very special part of our program, a live panel with four highly engaged and distinguished Pittsburgh re residents who will reflect on the accomplishments and challenges of the last 50 years of Earth Day. This is where you can submit your questions for a live Q&A, many opportunities to do that. And I get to talk to live people because I've just been talking to myself and the void that's out there, that's you all. But now I get to talk to real live beings from my home where also you also are at home. Uh, so I want to uh, welcome four of our guests, uh, starting with Dr. Patricia DeMarco, Dr. Jamil Bay, Quiba Bay, and Leandra Mira. Do I get to see them? Hey. If you could just turn on your mic so we can all say hello to each other at the same time. Hey, how are you? Hi. Hello, everybody. Hey, fellow beings who are all dressed up from the waist up. Yep. Yeah, I've been so <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm like, it's a very fancy day. I have new sweatpants. <laughs> I put on new socks. All right. And actually showered for once. So, yeah. Welcome, welcome, welcome all. I'm just going to do a quick um, introduction uh, to who you all are. And while I'm doing that, I want you to hold this uh, question, which is, um, what has brought you to Earth Day and how do you see yourself as a part of this movement? So like, what has brought you to this moment? Um, and kind of hold that question as I introduce each and every one of you. Dr. Patricia DeMarco's career in energy and environmental policy spans 50 years. She's an award-winning blogger, lecturer, and author on sustainability and nature and vice president of the Forest Hills Borough Council. She was also present at the very first Earth Day in Pittsburgh 50 years ago, in 1970. Leandra Mira is an 18-year-old climate activist in Pittsburgh with a passion for environmental justice and climate change. She is one of several youth leaders leading the 24-hour Pittsburgh Youth Climate Strike with Fridays for Future on April 22nd, starting at noon on Instagram. Something that we have in common is we're both 18. <laughs> uh, we have Jamil Bay. He's a native Pittsburgher and a real Renaissance man and devoted family man. As a researcher and analyst and consultant, he specializes in challenging common assumptions about ordinary concerns while bringing alternative perspectives for consideration. He is president and CEO of Urban Kind Institute. And we bring back our fellow guest, uh, Quiba Bay, who uh, co-founder, I feel like I haven't done enough with my life when I've read just a little excerpt of who you are, a mother of six, co-founder of Bugs, um, African Scouts, I have to go back and read all the things um, for you. Um, but deeply appreciative that you all have, each and every one of you have made your time, um, especially um, with farming that you probably have many things to do. Um, but let's start off, let's actually start off with Quiba and uh, tell us what has brought you here to this moment to Earth Day and tell us a little bit more. Then we'll go Quiba, Jamil, Leandra, and Patricia. Bring greetings, everyone. So my journey with Earth Day, if you watch the video, okay. it, it, it tells you that we tell you, black, as Black Wearers on our work day yesterday, that um, Earth Day is every day for us. It's not just a particular day and it's a day for each and every one of us to um, celebrate the earth and the work that we do. This is not the new in our culture. Um, we didn't need a holiday created 50 years ago to be responsible for how we treat the earth. Thank you. Thank you. Jamil? Should I wait for my prompt or just jump in? Uh, just jump in, please. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, I, I'm here today, said as 
one of the coordinators for the Black Environmental Collective. That's a network of folks who work at the intersection of health, environment, food, and climate change. And, you know, much like what Priva was talking about, you know, this is my first formal Earth Day participation event, and I've been around for at least 50 years. And it's that, that this is, you know, this is the work that we do. Um, and it's integrated into that. So health, environment, food, and climate change, we can't do one of those things. We can't only, you know, ignore the earth on the other 364 days, but, you know, just as an opportunity now to sort of think about this as a movement and an opportunity for us to connect what we're doing to other folks and, you know, bring it on in. Come on and let's get to, let's get to work. Um, so my uh, purpose for Earth Day has just been the fact that, um, you know, I'm going to live with this Earth for the next, you know, 70 years, I guess. Um, and I also have just been become more aware with age of the local environmental issues. And I just felt like I couldn't continue to go on with my daily life without addressing those issues and making changes to my own life and um, making it my purpose to make others aware of those issues. Well, I'm probably the old timer on this group. I am um, a participant in the first Earth Day in Pittsburgh in 1970. I was a graduate student and we did teach-ins not only in the streets, but also in the lecture halls that were open to the public. And I have been inspired by Rachel Carson since I was in sixth grade and I read The Sea Around Us when we were on a cruise ship on the way back from, the, from Brazil where my father was stationed to work and we were on our way back to Pittsburgh. And I received a copy of Silent Spring for my graduation present from high school. So I have been driven by the connection to the earth from my earliest years, and it is my profession. I have been in the environmental policy world since continuously, since 1968 at least. And um, I feel that our work is more urgently needed than ever now. Thank you all. And um, I want you to, in whoever it comes to, um, when we, just hearing about your experiences, I'm curious from your perspectives and lived histories, uh, what do you think the barriers to participation to Earth Day and environmental movement? And especially because I feel like it, each and every one of you have said it's been a part of your life, just your living, and it's been a part of human history. But what do you think the barriers are to participation to this day and to the environmental movement as a whole? Well, I, I would start with that. I think one of the biggest problems has been that we've developed silos, not only within the environment movement, but also within the whole progressive justice movement. We don't all speak the same language. We have urgent needs that are overwhelming and insurmountable in each of our areas. We haven't taken the time to develop a common sense of we're all in this together and we have a lot to share and give back to each other. Um, this, this sense of the tree huggers are somehow off there on left field and they're kind of crazy, you know, but really we're all in need of the trees and we're all in need of the fresh air, the clean water, the fertile ground, and the biodiversity of species that is our life support system. These are the gifts of the living earth and we have to all become more connected to the living earth and see ourselves as part of it. The silos and the specialization and the exclusion that happens in this movement has been a danger and, and made it difficult to get outside of the boundaries. We don't all speak the same language even. And building right on that, uh, you know, we talk about these silos, you know, we are a siloed society in general. And, you know, I grew up in a black community in the black neighborhoods and, you know, the folks who were environmental activists and organizers, you know, didn't include black folks and the issues that black folks were going through. And while the issues of the planet and it's, you know, the continual degradation are one thing, you know, so as, you know, we're still as equally concerned about police brutality. 
We're concerned about economic justice, so environmental justice, economic justice, health justice, all of these things. And you know, for us to say, okay, we're going to come in silo, we're going to break down the silo and work with you on this thing to save the planet. Meanwhile, we go back to our neighborhoods and continue the same sort of degraded, unbur overburdened, under-resourced communities that we lived in. It wasn't a welcoming environment, and so. You know, we're hoping now that we can have some of these bigger conversations. Folks are more open to be called on it. And so I think, you know, some of these doors are open and we need to, you know, kick them down. Well said. I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Bay. Um, my climate reality and those in our community may not look like yours. For instance, police brutality. Another example is gentrification. Gentrification is a form of climate change for us. When you're overserved, you're a, you're, you live in a primarily African-American uh, community and gentrification happens because of redevelopment that isn't fair, just, and equitable. So I agree with Dr. Bay and we often get this. Us having a voice at the table is one thing, but it's paramount for us to have our own table as well. Um, yeah, in my work, what I've noticed has been that, um, and this is probably doesn't need to be said, but not all students have the free time to organize or to um, have the chance to speak in these conversations. Um, some students need to work, they need to take care of their siblings, or they just have other responsibilities that um, have to come before organizing and um, fighting for whatever social issue is close to their heart. So I think that um, in my experience, what has been shown to um, continue to um, not allow everyone to be involved has just been, you know, some people have privileges that others don't. And um, that's true for um, young people and old people every age. Thank you all. Um, as I listen to you, what it um, what resonates with me and what's coming up is the notion that perhaps we've been socially distancing for a long time. That actually it's not a reflection of COVID-19. Um, if we don't really have an awareness of the people that we live near and next to, then we have been practicing social distancing. It didn't start today. And what? how might we connect and and see actually the lives because we can, we'll, we'll realize that, you know, some of the things that you talked about is that there's some people have more discretionary time uh, than others. They're um, resource and network rich. And um, perhaps actually there are people who've been doing the work already. Um, and so how might we kind of lift the veil and see the connections? And um, I wanna, pause to take because this is not just on me the community also has questions for you and i want to put in a question um, that has come to me via a whole team of people with filming, filming questions this one is specifically directed towards you leandra you are working with a group of dedicated students focused on raising alarm for climate change how hard is it to have a message heard by adults and perhaps the adults can respond afterwards. Did you get that question? Um, I haven't found it hard to be heard by adults at all, actually. And I get that question in most interviews or panels that I do. I think that the, the issue isn't necessarily that we aren't heard. It's that we're heard, but the response isn't always um, the response that we want. Um, we have elected officials who are extremely respectful, extremely kind to us. Um, so being heard isn't necessarily what we're after at this point. Now it's showing us that you hear us and also understand what we're saying and understand how important this is to us and acting and um, putting in laws and regulations that show us that um, you're not only hearing, but also respecting us. Thank you. Adults? I mean, I, 
you're also an adult. <laughs> just, I was like, you're an 18 year old. I mean, we're 18. Um, but from, from our other, and especially just history of being uh, on the front lines of this work, um, what do you think the barriers are for young people being heard, you know, from whatever communities that they represent? I'll say that I have, I have the good fortune of having students that I can talk to and receive feedback. I think it's very frustrating to have young people feel and see and actually viscerally embrace the urgency of climate action. I mean, we are declaring a climate emergency on this Earth Day, and it really is. But translating that into the urgency of especially legislative action, I've been at this since I was Leandra's age, maybe before. And I still feel that action is painfully slow, terribly inadequate. You go one step forward and three backwards, and we've been doing that for 50 years. I think the frustration level is rising, not only among the youth, but among some of us old warriors who are anxious to turn over the banner to a new generation and feeling completely frustrated that we have left things in such a mess in spite of all our efforts. And I think I can go on for several hours about why that is, but I'll stop there. I would like to say that it's very important to listen to our youth and let them lead as a urban farmer. I mean, they have the energy to do this work, but they also have ideas that are important. Sometimes we get stuck in our ways where we feel like, okay, traditionally, this is the only way to do something. But if we take time to work alongside our youth, guide them as well with our wisdom, but also let them take the lead. I think that's important. We have to appreciate that young people aren't always burdened by the uh, weight that we have when we're trying to think oh, we have to balance these issues with political considerations or economic considerations, where young people have this vision that they can see the, the catastrophe that's looming. They can see the great danger without that burden of, well, how do we balance this across this political spectrum to get a, a solution that we can agree on? Uh, and so we're, when we have to do that, we miss the urgency of that message. And so it's probably a, a good idea for us to just back up and say, what is it that you see from this clear perspective that you have without all the fuzzy head that we have? And let's, let's elevate that message. Let's push young people out front. Let's let you lead in this part of the conversation. Beautiful. Um, so it reminds me of like coming back to listening. And if we're, if this is an intergenerational responsibility, then we as adults are to be good followers, good listeners, um, and um, also offer opportunities and space for young people to lead. Uh, I have some individual questions for you um, as we wait for other questions to come in. Uh, so I'm gonna start with um, Patricia. Uh, what was unique about the first Earth Day that may be informative about our experience today? Well, the first Earth Day was a combined effort of Senator Gaylord Nelson with the support of a tremendous amount of union backing. The AFL-CIO ran the mimeograph machines. The workers were feeling very much part of the cry for better, healthier environment. They were on the front line in the mills. Uh, their kids were walking to school with bandanas over their faces because of the smoke. And they were really very aware of the fact that the occupational health and safety measures that have come in place since the first Earth Day were critical for their own well being. And that um, presence of labor is much more divided today in the environment movement. Um, we have gotten into the myth that in order to have good jobs, you have to be willing to take some pollution. And this very fatalistic acceptance that good jobs mean you don't necessarily have good air and clean water. This is the rebellion that is coming today, is that you, we know that we can have 
a clean environment and good jobs together. And indeed, if we don't have both, we will have neither. I think it's important to recognize that times are changing and the part of the labor movement that is going to be going forward and will survive is the part that is going forward in the sustainable fields, renewable energy, regenerative agriculture, green chemistry solutions that make a circular economy instead of raw material to trash. I think we have to work harder to make place for the labor movement in the environment movement and vice versa. Thank you so much. Um, and it's also interesting to contrast that, you know, that you went to the first Earth Day in Pittsburgh 50 years ago. And for some folks, it's today is their first Earth Day. Yeah. You know, and that's... It's a very I, weird Earth Day. There are no marches. There, I mean, there were millions of people in the streets on the first Earth Day. And in New York, it was like a ticker tape parade. It was tremendously, and we can't do that today because of the conditions that we're in. But I think the urgency is no less than it was then. So when I come to Cuba, um, and I love that you talked about that, not as only today Earth Day, but yesterday was Earth Day and tomorrow is Earth Day. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to, um, how has Earth Day, how has the Earth Day movement been culturally relevant to African and indigenous Americans? And your volume, you gotta tap into that wisdom. Yeah, <laughs> so once again, um, you know, we have our people traditionally, um, African descent people and indigenous people have always had a respect for the earth and our culture and everything that we do from planting food to taking care of one another to um practicing universal laws that have um moral value and moral compass in them as well of course this is a learning curve for all of us going through this pandemic um People are doing much better with socially distance themselves. But however, just a respect for the earth, even in planting your food, you would give respect to the great spirit and to your ancestors. And um, pour libations on the earth out of respect for mother earth before you even plant food. That is something that we practice. So it is relevant to us as a people, to indigenous people, and I say Africa for the word that most of you are familiar with, but our people were here way before slavery. We came in a mass because of slavery, but yes, our people are indigenous to this land as well. So 50 years ago, I'm glad Earth Day was created, but as our beekeeper said in the video, um, you had to create a holiday for the evil that was being done to this planet bottom line and if you look at the background of the creator of earth day i mean he murdered the woman and stuffed her in the closet in the trunk of a closet for 20 years that speaks volumes so it has been relevant to african slash indigenous people to respect the earth period you see that in festivals in the caribbean such as junkanoo it's basically ancient way of using the three R's. It's nothing new to us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Jamil, and you trusted me just to whatever question I was gonna ask, so I appreciate your trust. <laughs> um, so it's, I, I want to ask why you decided to start the Black Environmental Collective and why you think that's essential and supportive and to also speak about how you organize it because it is both a, a space for Black environmentalists to convene, but also you have these open convenings. And I, I, if you could say more about your desire to co-create that group and why you choose to um, convene and organize the way you do? Well, 
you know, and, and a shout out to my colleague, uh, Jason Beery, who was also instrumental in, you know, planting the idea and the seed for, hey, um, the, the idea that we know enough people in our network that are working on these issues. That's it, that intersection of health, environment, food, and climate change. And without being deliberate about lifting that voice up and working in a way that's intergenerational, intermunicipal, intersectoral, interdisciplinary to talk about these things, you know, but with that deliberate lens. And so, you know, in our network, you know, we try to have folks, you know, from Aliquippa to Clareton, um, you know, so to covering the entire, you know, southwestern Pennsylvania, but also folks who are uh, doulas, uh, folks who are uh, gardeners, folks who are researchers at, you know, some of the universities here, and the idea is just to keep this conversation going, that the issues that we have, you know, we can be the experts on those things. And in owning that space and making sure that we were looking out for each other and bringing that sensitivity to the issues that we understood. And I remember, you know, one of our first gatherings that we had, there was a um, woman who is the, she's a, a a researcher at Pitt. I met her when we were in grad school at Penn State together, and she's a, a, a soil chemist. And the first time that I introduced her to some of the members of Bugs, they were like, wait a minute, there's a black woman who looks like us, who talks like us, who's a soil chemist. We don't have to outsource our expertise anymore. And so the power of seeing her, and there's another researcher at Duquesne University who's, who's a, into agriculture, the power of seeing them in the gardens when Quiba and her group are working with young people and the experts, we don't have to outsource the expertise. There are uh, black women who look like the, the young kids that Quiba is trying to introduce to gardening. And so that continuity of, hey, you can be and you can do this work, that this expertise, the idea that we, um, we aren't in this together, we can shatter that. And, you know, so that was the, the, the main driver is making sure that we are setting our own table. And when we were trying to figure out, well, what's the name for it? And we called it a black green table. Uh, the idea, and we was mentioned, you know, something like this earlier today, that we need our own table. And we want to work with all of these folks. You know, when I met Patty DeMarco, and I haven't met Leandra formally, but the, we want to work, we need to be working with you. But your agenda and those things that are a priority to you are important to us, but that's not the all-encompassing part of our agenda because we have so many other things that really have to be, you know, on equal footing when we're prioritizing these issues. And so this, it's this intersection conversation that really is important to black folks because we can't, I mean, there are so many things that as a result of our relationship to this country and this economy and this political system and this health system where we've been under-resourced that we, we have to lift all of those up and the environment is critical. You know, lead issues are critical. Health issues are critical. Access to quality education is critical. And none of those are more important than the other because they're all important. And so that's why this network is, is so crucial to, you know, to keep alive. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And Leandra, for your individual question, why do you think the youth climate movement has been so successful? And in what ways do youth climate activists need to strengthen their approach? Um, I think that the youth climate movement has been successful because um, so many youth climate activists are so amazing at utilizing social media to boost their efforts. Um, and we sort of see this domino effect occurring where when one city is promoting their event, um, all that does is boost another city's event because things on social media spread so quickly. Um, and I think the way, for the second part of the question, I think the way that um, youth climate activists can improve their approach is um, opening up dialogue about burnout and how to be a well-rounded organizer. So I think that, um, and this is from my own experience, um, when you get into the mentality 
of organizing and being a doer, you forget how to be a student and how to be an active listener and really sort of allow yourself to think of what ways you can be organizing in a more efficient way rather than just producing a, um, an outcome that you need. And um, I think that it's imperative that we open up discussions about how to make this movement sustainable in a mental and emotional way so that we can continue organizing for years to come rather than just in these huge bursts of a couple months and then every youth activist becoming extremely burnt out and not being able to, um, to organize for another six months. Yeah, thank you. And to, to think the long view, we, we've had this conversation many a times of how can rest and restoration and care be part of an activist um, lifestyle as part of their arsenal. And you're talking about doing this till 88, another 70 years. So like, what's the long game to do this work? And a lot of wisdom on this panel. So I have some questions that have come from the wisdom of the community. And do I have a particular order? Or should I just, um, okay. So uh, here's the first question. Um, how has Earth Day succeeded or and or failed? Well, I'll start with that. Um, I think one of the early successes of Earth Day was that we did get the EPA established as a result of the Earth Day demonstrations. And even though the Clean Air Act had um, been passed in 1964, it was not widely in enforced. And so having uh, an agency for enforcing the environmental laws and for elevating the importance of a healthy environment if you're going to have healthy people, I think that was a very big success of the first Earth Day. Um, and there was a whole wave of laws passed in the early 1970s that were directly attributable to the citizen activism that emerged on a, on mass uh, on that first Earth Day. I think in terms of the longer term since then has been a constant erosion of the effectiveness of some of these laws as the industry lobbyists have gained more and more control over how the laws are written, how regulations are drafted, how they're implemented, and then devolving the enforcement powers down to the states so that you have an irregular and, and more um, variable um, way of implementing across the board in, depending on what state you're in. Um, so I find that we are now at a point where we need to reset, recalibrate, and take note of the fact that we have tremendous amounts of remaining issues. And some of them are much more insidious because you don't see black smoke in the air in Pittsburgh anymore, so people think the air is fine. But what you don't see hurts you worse. And benzene is a carcinogen. You don't see it. You don't smell it much but it, it is a carcinogen. And you have a lot of issues coming together where lack of enforcement has been equated with being um, negative to business. And so that connection, again, has gone to the detriment of the public health and welfare of people. You do not have healthy people if you don't have a healthy environment. And the laws of nature are not negotiable. It's going to continue getting worse unless we recognize the fact that we have to prevent the pollution of our air, the pollution of our water, and the destruction of the fertility of our land. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak to successes and or failures? Um, yes. Um, I like what everyone had to say. It's important as uh, urban um former that we don't make a difference between being a agriculturalist and an environmentalist. It's all one in the same. Because you know, working on land, doing work to get land and keep land is very important in how you treat the land. And a lot of times I see that farmers they don't make that um 
they make a difference. Like, oh no, I'm not an environmentalist, I'm a farmer. It's a farmer, especially working in urban ed. There is no difference to me. Um, there should not be no difference because the work is all together in concert. So that's very important in educating people that if you're an environmentalist, you can be a farmer as well. It's, it's one and the same, actually. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, I'm going to kind of combine them. One is, uh, is uh, I'll read both of them. Uh, how can the groups be more united? And the other question is, uh, what are the best ways allies can support you? What were, would you like to see allies doing to connect eco-justice with other forms of social justice? I guess that's what I've been talking about, huh? So I should jump in here. I mean, so one of the things that we, we've been attempting to do is that social part, you know, before we, not even before, in addition to the social justice part, we have to learn to be social. And a part of that is, you know, getting across those barriers that we hold that keep us from being able to sit and talk with people who don't eat what you eat or think what you think or believe what you believe or worship the way that you do. Uh, and so the, the, the higher order needs that we have as a community, as a society, you know, clean air, clean water, clean soil, uh, those kinds of things, it, it's easier to politicize them when I think that the other people who are going to be taking advantage of clean air are not like me. And so the idea, we, we really just, as, a, as people, have to learn to be better at you know, being neighbors, being friendly, being social, and that aspect of it. That's crucial. Um, it, it's hard to see someone else's plight as your own when you're so intent on othering that person. And so we really need to think about what does it mean to be a human, to be people, to be social? And what does that mean for our birds? for our, you know, other the mammals that are in our, in our space that we share with. What does that mean to think about how we have to exist together? And that, it starts with that. I'd like to add something to what Jamil just said, is that we're more alike as humans than different in religion or culture or race or affiliation of any other kind. And we are all subject to the same needs as common animals in the world of nature. We are part of a larger ecosystem, part of the interconnected web of life. We're only one part, and yet we're tearing huge holes in it. And we need to be recognizing of the fact that we are more like each other than we are different. Agree wholeheartedly. Um, so for instance, well, we have a small garden in the uptown section of the Hill District, we are constantly working with the soil to fix the soil every year because there's traffic constantly. So the air pollution is getting into the soil. The air pollution is getting into the vegetables. So we're constantly amending that. And let me stand corrected. Um, when I were, was talking about one of the co-founders of Earth Day, I was not talking about Senator Gaylord. I was talking about um, Ira Inhorn. So I, you know, just for transparency, I don't want everybody to get upset, but yes, I was talking about him. But moving forward, yes, it does affect us in, in various ways, who, regardless of who we are, where we live, because if they're spraying your vegetables with chemicals on a farm and we're not aware of it, we're all eating the same vegetables. So yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, I think that the way to better unite the environmental organizations, um, just starting within the state, is we sort of need to all agree on a couple common goals, because I think that when we begin to, um, to lose sight of all of our similarities and what we all want is when we begin to have really negative disagreements or 
see each other as too different from ourselves to work together and um, work toward a common goal. And um, I think that we also forget how short the timeline is for how fast we need things to happen for us not to get to a tipping point where um, the changes will be irreversible and the damage will be irreversible. Um, so I think to answer the first question, um, to unite um, environmental organizations is to all get behind a couple common goals. Beautiful. So I want to kind of, as we're bringing things to a close, that uh, um, what you all have talked about has reminded me of the power of words and language. And I think about words um, that we would think, you know, is this, no this notion of connection to ancestors and lineage. And so I think about uh, two words. One is um, from the Mayan tradition, Enloch Etch, you are my other me. And that, you know, we often can be confused by these socially things, things that we have socially constructed as humans did not see our humanity. And also a Swahili word, Ubuntu, I am because you are. And these are just one of many words that are, um, have been given to us as our ancestors to be reminded to see one another. And so with that notion, I want to bring up a word, hope. And not the kind of hope that brings forth the things that we most fear, but a kind of hope that is actionable. And so my um, question for you as we close um, this uh, conversation is uh, what gives you hope? I'll start. I, I think this is an opportunity for us to reimagine America as it could be in harmony with nature, to reimagine America not the way it was before we have this pause from the COVID-19, but as it can be if we're living in a harmony with the natural world, to use our energy system from renewable and sustainable base that is available everywhere already distributed and just needs the infrastructure to capture and use it and make microgrids in communities. This is happening already all over the world. And it's a lot of it is technology, but a lot of it is applying it and making it available everywhere. And I think what gives me hope too is the recognition that connectivity in communities is the strongest force we have. When communities are under duress and you're forced to co-locate with each other, you make those connections more real. And when people are faced with this kind of a challenge, the creativity is unleashed. And I have every confidence that we're going to come out of this with a much better appreciation of the fact that we are fragile and that we have to take care of each other all the time. This isn't something you can just do in a crisis, but we have to reach out to our neighbors, to our brothers, to our friends, and make sure that we are all coming along together because we're only as strong as the weakest link. You cannot pretend that those communities that we don't see don't matter because we all matter and the virus doesn't care. And that has elevated that concept that we have to take care of all of us if we're all gonna do better. And I think we have a much better future ahead of us if we can go back to basics and recommend, recognize that the social safety net and the environmental protection net are things that are necessary for every one of us to thrive in this world. Thank you. As I'm thinking about this, you know, the hope and where hope begins, uh, you know, what's the starting point? If you would have asked the same question, you know, before we were all sequestered, you know, I probably would have had a different answer now, but, it, or at least my explanation would have been different. I mean, so one, I'm hopeful because I'm, you know, just constantly reminded by young people that this is something that they see it that's worth, um, you know, worth 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 getting into and digging into, wrapping their hands around, 
and with the types of innovations and the new ways of thinking that young people bring to these types of movements, you know, that gives me hope. How do I take my experience, work with young people to, you know, do what I can do to lift up what they're doing? That, that's hopeful. And that would have been my pre-COVID answer. And I'm still, I'm just going to add to that now that one of the things, you know, that, that Patty was talking, you know, brought this up, the laws of physics and the, where it doesn't change. At some point, you know, it's not going to work. And hopefully we can do something before we get to that point. But we are, as a globe right now, planetarily, we're all stopping. We paused. We have this moment to reflect. And we still see people out and thinking and doing ridiculous stuff. And we still see politicians and folks who are terrified by this moment who are reacting in this you know, very predictable way. But the hope is that there are enough people right now who have this chance you know, together to think about some of these things. Where are we? What is happening? Who is really ready to go back to pre-COVID-19 world, politically, socially, economically? And other than the folks who really benefited from that, and there, that's really very few. The rest of us are hoping, we have a chance to redefine it in our relationship to that world. So I'm hopeful that you young folks, Leandro, you're on the spot now, that you young folks are going to give us the pathway to make those connections. Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate what both the other speakers said before me, which is um, it's hard to have hope right now, um, for me at least, but I have been getting hopeful thinking about the ways that um, people will come out of this maybe with their eyes more open to how the systems in place before this crisis have failed us. I mean, seeing the videos of, and this isn't necessarily environmental, but seeing the videos of families lined up for the Pittsburgh Food Bank has been, like, it, it's just despicable that, like, we're living in a country where so many people don't have access to food or water or health care, and so many communities are just completely defenseless against this crisis. And so, um, to not have an existential crisis myself, I have to be hopeful that um, we'll come out of this with a new perspective for people who weren't feeling that these systems were bad beforehand. And um, maybe we'll come out of this more motivated to change the systems and um, demand human rights for everyone. Very well said, Leandra. I have a question. Are you still in high school? Just graduated like a week before the, um, the quarantine started. Okay. Well, I'm glad you graduated because a lot of people aren't. I'm hopeful. This is an unfortunate um, situation, but I have hope when I see dedicated frontline essential workers. Um, I'm considered a essential worker because I'm a farmer. And I'm talking about people in hospitals that have families to go home to who are risking their lives. People who are standing in those lines that you mentioned, mentioned um, Leandra, to give food away to people who need food, desperately need food, because they're pissing, pitting their life at risk. So when I see that dedication coming from various people from various backgrounds from different communities that are on the front line helping other people who, who are in need i'm hopeful i'm hopeful that we'll all get through this and learn and as dr bay said you know learn from mistakes so we won't have this happen to us again thank you i want to thank each and every one of you personally for whether it's your first Earth Day or your 50th Earth Day, that we actually are creating the opportunities to open a portal to other worlds. It's our right and responsibility to co-create the future. 
and what we are offering um, to all those who are listening now and in the future is how will we move from awareness to action? That would not be enough to clap in the healthcare workers and to say thank you, but how will we um, collectively act to hold spaces of love, of compassion, of dignity? And I thank you, each and every one of you, for bringing us to awareness and for all that you do, the invisible, beautiful work to make those futures possible. Happy Earth Day. Today. Thank and you, tomorrow. Michelle. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. We appreciate thank you. you. Thank you, Michelle. Work. You've done a great job all day. <laughs> and everyone who organized this, Kelsey, Michael, Mark, um, Mark. Lacey. Thank you, everyone. Well, Deb, yes. There, there's a this is um I think what we'll what we're seeing, like this is not possible because we're all doing it from our homes unless we have actually created the network and fibers of love uh, and everybody doing their part and, and know that so much of our life is supported by the invisible work of strangers. Um, and can we be more intentional and actionable as we go out from this point? So. And I hope everybody you. donates to the food bank. <laughs> Please. Yes. And keep in mind, if this is done next year in whatever form or fashion, that have everyone at the table before an agenda is set to be fair, just, and equitable. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.